Timothy Award we had this morning. When I was, when I was that age, I memorized a piece of scripture uh, written by a man who had undergone lots and lots of difficulty in his life. He had been hunted. He had experienced great fear, probably, great frustration, great rejection. And he, he wrote a piece of uh, poetry for us that many of us probably have memorized. And it goes like this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And then, and then it says this. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. It's written by a, a man named David, who was a king of Israel around 1000 BC, roughly, 3,000 years ago. And it's interesting because he, he taps into something here that has been the experience, the lived experience, I think, of people who have followed God for millennia. And that's that sometimes we are going through life and it feels like we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. In fact, our, our book of Genesis that we, are, we started looking at last week and we're going to continue in this morning was written most likely, as far as we can tell, to a group of people who were wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. Moses probably wrote it during that 40 year, he compiled it, he, he sorted it out and the Holy Spirit inspired him, he put it together during the 40 year wilderness wandering while the people were just wandering and they would get up and there would be manna in the morning and God would provide for them miraculously, but it was a time of great, like, 40 years of wandering. See, it's been the experience of God's people often that they feel like they're walking through the valley of the shadow of death or they're living in a wilderness over and over and over again. And the hard thing about that is anytime you go through something for a long period of time, especially something difficult, something happens inside of us, inside of me, that we start to ask questions that we start to have doubts in our minds. We start to, at least I do, we start to think, you know, I, I believe God is good, but I don't see his goodness. It's hard for me to like wrap my mind around how, how, how God's goodness, which I talked about last week, you know, when he created everything, he turned around and he said, and it was very good. That was his original intention for creation. It's hard to see in, in a time where we are walking through the valley of shadow of death, and the valley of the shadow of death seems to just go on and on and on, or we're walking through the wilderness, and it just seems to go on forever. We're walking through a season of COVID-19, and it just goes on and on and on unrelentingly. You could insert there any difficulty that you have, but it's easy to start asking the question, is God really good? Does God really care about this? Does God really see what I'm going through? Or is he turning a blind eye? And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25, if you'd like to turn there with me. Because here at the beginning, we have, we have something interesting. We have two creation accounts. We have the creation account for what we looked at last week, which is this big picture, wide angle, broad brushstroke kind of view of the creation account, the beginning of the world. And then, interestingly enough, the very next thing that the author did was he put in a, a second account. He put in a second account, and, and there's, there's a question, why, why would he do this? I think uh, from, from a theological like, perspective, he, he did this. These, these accounts are similar, but they're not the same Exactly. They're not completely like overlapping. People have spent a lot of time thinking, how do these how do these two things like fit together? And those are good questions, but but what I'm interested in this morning is why would he why would he talk about this? Why would he communicate this to us? What was he trying to say to the original audience? What would their questions have been? So Genesis chapter two, verses four to twenty-five. 
And I'd, I'm using a, a thing like this. A lady came up and showed me this morning. She has one. It's pink. It's very cute. I would never have it. Okay? Like, um, you won't find me with one of the, the ESV illuminated scripture journals on Genesis. They, they make two, two varieties. There's, there's a really nice one. Carolyn, you want to? Yeah, it's right there. See? Very nice. Yeah. You won't find me walking around with, like, with that, okay? I'm not that secure in my manhood. Um, but it, it's, it's just a book of Genesis. It's got the text on one side. It's got a place for notes on the other side. If you want to get one of these, you can get them at the Good News Bookstore. You can order one online. Uh, just a nice little tool, 5 or $6, you could grab one. But if, if, whether you get one of these or not, I just encourage you to get a Bible. The Bible is the Word of God from the Creator of the universe, the one who knows everything, knows you, and he wants to communicate something to you. And I, I would just pray that, that you would get a Bible, however you do that, and just pick it up and read it this week. Genesis chapter 4, or chapter, chapter two, 2, verse 4, says this, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the earth, it's giving the setting for this, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there, is, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second is the, the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. We're going to come back to those words, to work it and keep it, because those, those words are very, very interesting in what they mean. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And I'm not going to talk about that this week, but it is an emphatic construction in the original language. You shall surely die. So we're going to come back to that next week, but it's interesting what God says there. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave, to, gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. That sounds like a long task list. You know, you kind of wonder, like, as he got to the end of every day, was he just, like, tired? And he's like, whatever. But so that's, a, that's a big job. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up, up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last, and these, these are the first, as far as I can tell, these are the first recorded words by a human being in the Bible. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed." And this morning, we are gonna, we're going to see something here, I think, that is directly getting at this question of what do we do? How do we, how do we know how God is, even when we're walking through a season, a long, difficult, hard season, we might feel it's the valley of the shadow of death. What do we hold on to in that so we don't just doubt the heart of God towards us? 
The thing that jumps out of these pages at me as we look at it, I mean, there's lots of questions about creation. Where does this fit in the six days of creation? What does this look like? I mean, how do those things like interact? There, there's those questions, but, but I said last week, those are kind of, they're good questions, but they're kind of like getting fixated on the pixels of a picture. If you get too fixated on the pixels of a picture, you don't actually get to enjoy the whole picture. And as we pan out, I think this is what we see here. We see emphatically that the author is making a statement that God's heart is good. That when we are walking through a season that is difficult, that feels like the valley of the shadow of death, we we need to come back and we need to believe once again, we need to fixate on, on the truths that we see here, which is saying that God's heart is good. We may be going through something difficult. We may be experiencing stuff we would rather not. And yet Genesis chapter 2 says that God's heart is good. We, we, see, we see an interesting switch here in verse 4. This is the, the, the dividing line between the first story and the second story. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, it's interesting that he says the Lord God because in Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis 2, 3, the author refers to God not as the Lord God. He refers to him as God. The Hebrew word is Elohim. But here, starting in Genesis 2, 4, there's a switch. He starts to refer to God as something, something different with a different name or a slightly different name. He says the Lord God. He says Actually, the word is Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh being the covenant name that God reveals to Moses at, Mount si- or at the burning bush on Mount Sinai when he asks, who am I supposed to say sent me? And God says, I am that I am, Yahweh. That's my name. In our Bibles, in keeping with the Hebrew trans- translation, instead of pronouncing, the, the, the Hebrew people had such reverence for the name of God that they didn't pronounce it, so they would just say the Lord. So here we have the Lord God, or Yahweh God. And I think this is a signal that the author is making a change in how he's portraying God. It's not that God has changed. He's just taking a different view He wants us to see something. This is a personalization of God. This is a zooming in. Instead of the the big picture, which we got last week, it's a zooming in to a particular instance in the care with which God is going to create the first human beings. Now, now you you have to know, there's been people, and they have taken this difference, and they said, okay, so there's two different authors here. There's the, the person who wrote Genesis chapter 1, and then there's people, they say there's a different person that wrote Genesis 2. The way we know that is they use different names for God. If they hadn't used different names, if, if they weren't different authors, then why would they use different names for God? It's a valid question. I don't think it's a necessary conclusion that it was two different authors written centuries apart. Because we believe the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I think as we look at this, it's clear like, that he is making a, a distinct point about who God is and how he interacts with mankind. In Genesis 1, he's the transcendent God. And in Genesis 2, he's, he's, he's also the imminent God, the one who is near and close. And that's what we see. He says, he says all this, this things that, that go up, in, and then in Genesis chapter, or verse 7, he says, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. He formed him. And this word that is used is the word for he, he, he shaped him. Like it's the word used of a potter and a pot. I've never done, uh, well, we did some, like, I don't even remember, some loop pottery when I was in school. You would, you know, do this. But my wife, she took a pottery class in, um, in college one of those really difficult classes. D- depending on who you are, it would be difficult for me. 
But she took this, and, and the thing, you, you, you set the clay there, and you have to work it, you have to soften it up with water so it's malleable so you can work it, and then, then you start to turn it. And as I've, I've seen, like, it, it's not a clean process. The clay gets all over your hands and probably up to your elbows. I think more than likely if you're wearing nice clothes, you want to cover up your clothes so that they don't get all, all dirty or you wear something that, you know, is, is made for that purpose. And this is the picture that our author wants us to see of God's creation of the first, the first man, and I think even the first woman as he creates her out of this rib. That he has got his hands in the process. As he's forming this man, his, his hands are, are getting, they're, they're, he's so near to it that his hands are getting, getting dirty in the process. He's got dust on him. And then, it says, and then it says, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So he had his hands on him in, in creating it. And, you know, God is a spirit, so he doesn't literally have hands. The, the author is just trying to communicate to us uh, something about how intimately involved God was in this process, and then it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It's like if he'd had lips, he put his lips onto the man and breathed life into him. This is an intimate, very near kind of creation. And this, this gets at the, the overall point, God's heart is good. When we ask the question, does God, does God notice, does God see, is he involved, is he, is he missed something, is he, is he too, too interested in the big questions of life to, to know what's going on in my life, I think this comes to us and says, no, you know what, he, he's near. That's part of his, his goodness. Then we see something else in, in his relationship to the man, verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden. It's interesting because you, you ask the question, if, if there's someone and they could speak and everything would come into being, why couldn't they just speak in the garden just be there? But yet, it says he planted the garden. It's as if he went location by location, took specific seeds, put them in the, the specific spots. He planted this garden. He took painstaking care with this garden And there he put the man whom he had formed. Why? Because this was, some, this was a place prepared for the man to work. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him. He, he, the, the word is, is he, he picked him up and placed him in the garden to work it and keep it. And there's a number of words for work. The word work here is, was really interesting to me as I was looking at it because it's the word that is to serve it. It's the word we get to serve something. Even to serve in like a, a religious, like priestly context. The people who, you, you could say to minister to it. It's not the normal word yet that's just used for toiling. It's the word that's used for service, even service of God. And then he says to keep it, to guard it, to watch over it. This is the reason that God put him in the garden. He gave him a purpose in it. It reminds me of, there's a verse in Ephesians 2.10. It says, we are God's workmanship, the same kind of idea. He's the craftsman, we're his workmanship. He says, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. And it's the same. We see the same picture. He prepared this, this garden. He planted it. He brought the man to it to work it and keep it. And in, in verse 20, he even, he even gave the man tremendous responsibility and dignity. He says he gave the man name. The man was able to give names to all the livestock and all the birds, everything. The man didn't create these things. It wasn't his prerogative or right to name them. But God said, you know what? I'm going to allow you to do this. See, God was near, but God also provided for the man. He provided him work to do. He provided him 
a place to work. He gave him the freedom to choose, which is, is really interesting. In verse 9, he, it says, the Lord God made to spring up every tree, and that included the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil wasn't a weed. It wasn't a mistake. It's something that God intentionally put there. He gave it to him so that the man would have the ability to freely choose to obey or not to obey. There's a question, why would he do that? Why would he, why would he give the man the freedom to choose when he knew perfectly well what the man was going to do? Over in Genesis 127, it says, God created him. He created us in the image of God. And God is perfectly free. He can do whatever he wants. He has no limitations. And I think this is on the same level. Why do we have the freedom to choose? Because we are created in the image of God. And had he not put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden, the man wouldn't have had the freedom to choose. It wouldn't have been an option. And all of this is in direct, like, contradiction, contrast to the, the prevailing view of the world, the prevailing myth of the world at the time, how, how the world came to be. He said that the gods had made the world. And this is from, I, I quoted this last week, it's from a, a story called the Enuma Elish, which is the uh, Mesopotamian, the Assyrian, Babylonian creation myth. And in their view, Marduk was the God who created all the earth. And this is the words of Marduk when he created mankind. He said, my thought is to create a primitive human to be called man. And the work which is now done by the gods, he will do. So that the gods will not be required to labor forevermore. In other words, why was mankind made? Mankind was made to do the menial jobs that the gods didn't want to do themselves. But in Genesis 1 and 2, we see something completely different. We see that God imbued the, the human couple with great responsibility, that he took great care with them, that he created them in his image, that he was near, he formed them, he breathed into them the breath of life. We see something else in verse 18. We see the, the care with which God has over the man, that he deeply cared about this, this first man. And as he looked at him, he knew that in his heart, he, he was probably asking the question, how come there's not somebody like me? There's all these pairs of animals. There's not somebody like me. There, I don't have a, a pair. I don't have somebody that, that goes with me in the same way that the animals do. And in verse 18, it says, the Lord God looked at him and said, it is not good that the man should be alone. See, God was near to the man. God provided for the man all the things That he had. And then we see God cared deeply about this, this man. He, he formed this woman to compliment him, that they would go together. He brings her to him. He institutes marriage, which is to be a blessing and a joy. See, God's heart is good. That's what, that's what Genesis 2, I think, is saying it to, to us as people. God's heart is good. Look at his heart. And the thing that we have to wrestle with is, because, is, is in this text, this is a perfect situation. This is before the fall. So we could say, yeah, God's heart is good, but is it, is it, has it changed? Am I such a screw-up? Is our world so broken that God's heart has changed? That he, he, his heart towards us is no longer good. And, and this is where, you know, the, the Bible bears witness. And I've got something up here called the New City Catechism, which is something I'm, I'm working on myself. I'm going through, I'm memorizing the, the question. There's questions and then answers and then Bible verses that go along with them. And this is number two of the New City Catechism. The question is, what is God? He says, God is the creator and sustainer of Everyone and everything. And then look at this. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable. And when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death for a long time, when we go through the wilderness, when we experience a long 
difficult period in our life, it is easy to ask the question, well, yeah, God was good back then, but is he still good today? And the scriptures, they, they point to this, that he hasn't changed. He's the same. And I think we, we see that in the, the New Testament. If we ask the question, how do we know for sure that God is the same today that he, he was back then when he created the first man and the first woman? How do, how do we know? What evidence do we see? I think, I think we, we look at the, the, the man on the cross. That Jesus proves God's good heart. Jesus proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's heart is still good. Even after sin entered the world, wrecked everything, death came about, sickness, all the things that make us, make us crazy, that, that form the valley of the shadow of death, that are the wilderness in our lives, all of those things, we look at the man on the cross, we see that God's heart hasn't changed. Jesus proves that God's heart is good even today. I'm just reminded, there's a lot of verses you can, you can look at. I'm thinking of the Timothy word. This is maybe one of the first verses that a, a kid would memorize, John 3, 16. I think often our faith is so simple. You know, if, if, if I could just internalize this and live out of this verse every day, if I, if I really understood its ramifications for me, how would, it change, how would it change me? You know it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave this is the heart of God. He so loved the world, even the broken world. The world that is so shattered and, and difficult and full of, of hardship and suffering. He, he so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only son. Some translations say his only begotten son. The idea is his unique, perfect, precious son like whom there is, is none other. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's forever with the Father in eternity past, existing in a relationship of perfect love and joy and harmony. And the Father says, and the Father and the Son, they put their heads together and, and they decided that the Son was going to come. And this giving wasn't an easy or a nice giving was the giving that Jesus came and he suffered. He was a poor peasant who struggled in life in ways that you and I, we've probably never struggled for most of us just to exist and subsist. Maybe some of us have. And he had a three-year ministry and ultimately at the end of that ministry he was rejected wholesale by the people to whom he had ministered. He, he was forsaken by the people who were closest to him. And he was taken and he was brutalized. The scriptures say beyond recognition. His body was laid open by whips. He was mocked, spit upon, ridiculed, nailed to a cross. This is the gift. The gift of God's love that proves that God's heart is good. And, and the, reason, the reason at the end of John 3, 16, the, the, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He did this because he loved you and I. He loved the world. He didn't want us to, be, to suffer forever in our sin and the consequences of our sin, but he, he determined that, that he was going to do whatever he could to make a way. See, Jesus proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, God's good heart. That even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, what Genesis 2 that speaks to us about God's being near and God caring and God providing, we see that this, the same God who, who, who put his, his hands and his lips on that first man and cared for him, the same, the same God who noticed his great need of a partner, is the God who came and who walked around as a man and bore the full penalty of our sin on the cross. See, he's the same. 
He's the same. So when we are going through uh, difficulty, as we are, all of us, this is a difficult time. I think the thing that we need to do, that I need to do, is we've got to trust God's good heart. We've got to reject the lie that says, you know what, maybe God isn't good. Maybe God doesn't see how you're struggling. Maybe God doesn't care about it. There's a question that I have that's formulated something like this. Are the circumstances of my life, the valley of the shadow of death, the difficulties that I'm going through, are, am I allowing those to shape the way I view God? Say, you know, because life is so difficult, then God must not be really truly good. Or is my view of God, my rock-solid view of God, that the Scriptures again and again say, He's so good. He wants to pour His goodness out. That's, that's His heart towards us. Is that shaping the way we understand our circumstances so that even this, even this difficulty becomes something through which He's trying to work in us? I just have to confess too often, you know, when I'm tired or upset or afraid or angry, it's easy to be like, well, God, I don't know. Father, I don't know. It, it doesn't, doesn't seem like you're good in this moment. And that's something that I've got to confess. I've got to say, Father, please forgive me. Help me to turn from that. Help me to, to change my, my view. That's called repentance. Just some, a, few, a few thoughts. How do, we, how do we deal with this question? If we're having doubts about the goodness of God because of our circumstances, I'd, I'd encourage you to talk to a friend. One of the reasons we're trying to get some small groups started, I know we, we know it's been difficult not having connections groups or the normal stuff here at church, but we also know it's so important that we have people in our lives who know us, who care about us, who pray for us, people who know what's really going on that we'll share the real stuff with. If you have a person like that, praise God for that and, and talk to them. Share with them what you're thinking Ask them to pray for you. Another thing uh, we, we can do, rehearse and repeat what is really true. That even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That he cares, that he's near, that he provides. One way you can do that is to memorize some of these scriptures. John 3.16, may, probably most of you have memorized. Most of us have. Psalm 23, I bet a lot of us have memorized that as well. There's other ones. Romans chapter 8, there's a verse in there that says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also together with him graciously give us all things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Friends, those verses are verses we need to have deep in our heart when we are going through the hard things in life. And then lastly, I'd say, if you're, you're struggling, we can ask God. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Say, Holy Spirit, would you prove to my heart once again that, that God is good, that you are good, even in, even in this hard thing that I'm going through in my life, even as life has been turned over and is difficult, even as I, I, my natural tendency is to be full of fear and doubt or anger or, or frustration or whatever it is, would you show me once again what is really true? See, we live in this world and it's, it's broken. And the longer we experience the hard things, the easier it is to just give up. the easier it is to become, like, cynical, to kind of protect ourselves from hope, to doubt that God's heart is really good. And yet Genesis 2, it comes and says, you know what? Even in the midst of that, this is, this is the God that we know. He created us. Got his hands dirty in the process. He breathed life into each one of us. 
He's prepared things for us to do just as he prepared something for the first man and the first woman. Not only that, but he sent his son. What more could he have done? So let's pray. Father, I I pray that we would know who you are. Lord, that though our world is broken, Lord, right now it is it, it feels even more broken than usual. We would know your goodness. Lord, the what Genesis 2 says about you that you are a God who is near, you care, you protect, you provide. Lord, the rest of the Bible bears out. And I pray that you would help us to trust that that is true. Lord, even in this difficult season of life, I pray that you would help us to speak that to the deep places of our heart. I pray that when we have doubts, when I have doubts, I would would look at the man on the cross bleeding for me, for us. Lord, that we would have hope in his resurrection. Pray this in his name. Amen.